Ways Goose 2018. Cutting new wood type with a historic pantograph. Scott Moore of Moore Wood Type. Well, thank you. Letterpress printing was part of industrial arts from the 1940s through the uh, mid-70s. And my degrees are from Miami University, and I worked as a lab assistant, and one of the courses I had to take was letterpress printing, and we set little metal type and made a, a note card. But I was working work study, so I was assigned there for a year to help maintain the equipment and to help. And I knew a lot more than the professor did who was teaching it. Uh, but after, other than that, I didn't print. When I got my job at Pickerington Schools on the east side of Columbus, they didn't do in-house printing. It was a small rural farm school, which is now 4,000 in the high school, two high schools. But, um, so we weren't doing in-house. So I never touched a printing press for the next 30 years. It wasn't part of my job. I was doing other things, video production and wood and robotics and all the fun, interesting things. And my daughter went to Miami as an undergraduate, and she came home at the end of her sophomore year and went, we found a whole room full of printing presses. Because what happened was there, when offset printing came along, the art departments, the book art fairs, everyone sold all their printing equipment for scrap. And now this big, huge revival in the last 10 years of I want to touch it, I want to make it, I want to smell the ink. Um, the United States went from 800 printers to 8,000 letterpress printers. And every program that used to have offset pr or letterpress printing are buying back the machinery at 10 times the cost they paid, they sold them for. So it's a big market in buying old stuff and reselling it for a fortune. And there are people, like six people in the United States that do that full time. Um, so she came home and said, I know, we found this. And I was using the printing terms with her. And she went, how do you know that? And I said, I, the equipment is actually my industrial arts equipment that they, when they got rid of the department, they stored. So over the next two years, she worked with the head of the department and they reestablished a letterpress program at Miami University called the Curmudgeon Press was their press name. And, um, and so she worked with that, and I didn't get too involved. Then she got married, she went off and worked in the commercial advertising, and then she met this guy from Oklahoma, I didn't know, and married him. And for a wedding present, her mother-in-law bought her a little Kelsey 5x8, little tiny press on eBay for $1,000, which is ridiculous. So I picked it up and took it to her, and she was playing, and she met Dave Pete and some of the other big famous printers that are here, and they gave her type and bought type. And then she said, Dad, I need an E. There's no E in this, and I want to I wanna use an E. And there's no, will you make me a heart? And will you make me an Ohio? And I'm sorry, Ohio, I'm not supposed to say that. The O state. <laughs> so, um, and she made some things. And I, I went to try to find wood to make type with. It had to be 918,000 thick wood. And only one company made it in New Jersey. And they wanted $40 for a little five, five by seven block. And I made her this stuff with a little hand crank pan or mill. And then I measured it and it was 22 thousandths under type high. I called the guy, I said, you said it's type high. He goes, well, it's close. I said, he said, just pad it up. I said, I can't do that. I said, I started thinking maybe as a retirement job, I should start doing this since no one's doing this since 1960. Uh, there's a big market for it. So, um, and they actually contacted me when their guy left to see if I would become their supplier. <laughs> but I said, no, I've got, I've got enough stuff going on. So basically, I started making wood type, and then I realized there was no one making this anywhere. Um, and so my daughter paid for me to go to Hamilton Museum, the old building, for a week. An intern was Norb, the last surviving type cutter. And they were so excited at Hamilton to have anyone starting to make wood type again that they gave me access to all their machinery. And I got to take things apart and measure and do stuff that most people don't get to do. Uh, and then I went home and I built my own Hamilton pantograph, big stand up and run pantograph. And then I thought, and I was leaving, I was at a, visiting a friend's business who was retiring and he had a small pantograph, this one right here actually, that was on a shelf. And I was walking out and I said, you have a pantograph. He goes, yeah, we broke it with a piece of metal a long time ago. Again, I teach machine shop. So I machined out a new part, and I have a working pantograph. And then I applied what I learned at Hamilton to, um, to 
modify these. And I help lots of people around the world. I have a guy in Australia right now I'm working with to make an engraving machine into a pantograph. Um, and I help them. And people say, well, you're giving away your secrets. And I'm going, no, 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 no. There's only like five people doing this. I said, the more people in the world making type, the better. And I'm glad to help people learn and help, help them get started. So that's how I got started, making type. And now I do it full time. I travel around the country um, and lecture about it. I take this small pantograph along, and I let uh, students cut a piece of type. And then when they get done, they're like, oh, I've made gold. It's like, I'm like OK, yeah, it's type. And then said, so, are you going to ink it? And they go, oh, then it'll be dirty. And I'm going, <laughs> and that's the biggest question I get is, is you know, they buy all this type from me, and then they get it dirty, and they go, well, how do I get the blue off of it? And I'm going, no, 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 all that black type you have, wood type, is thousands and thousands of people washing it with paint thinner and ink. I said, it was all originally new wood type. So um, this is a quick version of the slideshow I, I do when I go to these colleges, but it's, it really makes a point about the history and where it came from. Um, America was in the right place at the right time. Up until uh, they started uh, coming to America, if you wanted to run an ad for your farm, they cut, set it in metal type, and they put it in a newspaper, or they would post it real small somewhere. And America became uh, a need, came up for large letters. They were printing broadsides. Americans weren't all reading newspapers, and they wanted to be walking by, going somewhere, or riding by, going somewhere, and see it. They wanted to grab that person's attention. So America kind of introduced this whole new big billboardy type thing. We had all kinds of wood. Old growth wood grows very slowly, a sixteenth of an inch a year. And there was lots of that in New York and Connecticut and Wisconsin. And they had lots of white oak that they were building cabinets with. So America uh, kind of became the center. Metal type, if you ever cast metal type, you know that if you get above two inches, it shrinks 4% as it cools. And if you get above two inches, it concaves or cracks. Uh, Greg Walters in Pickwell, Ohio, has a supercaster. And he actually cast some type that I saw some out in the front, uh, two inch initials. But that's as big as you can make. And it's very, very heavy. So anything above two inches was always done in uh, wood. But they were hand carving it. It's much cheaper to produce. Um, America needed a whole bunch of different varieties. Um, unlike the few limited fonts they had brought with them or they bought from England or, or France or wherever they were from, um, they needed to have different sizes. And it just became a perfect thing. Um, there are three different processes. William Page, boy, that jumped way ahead. Okay. Um, so about 1840, William Page uh, started designing wood type. And there was, um, his process was stamping. He would take actually an end grain maple is like a whole handful of straws. And it's very unique in that you can compress it and it doesn't make the sides bulge. So you could compress it and get a beautiful printing image without doing damage or distorting it. So he invented a, a process where they actually stamped the negative space away on the letter. So if you ever go to an antique store and see wood type, and you look at the capital A, the capital A is where they marked it on the side. And if you pick it up and it says William Page and Company, you go, oh, look how dirty this type is. It's not worth very much money. I'll pay you so little for it. But basically, it's very, very rare. But it's very, very shallow. Um, Hamilton came along and invented veneer type. And he actually didn't make the veneer. There was a veneering company nearby, and they actually made the veneer for him. And, uh, and then nowadays, then another process came up where they could use a pantograph, like I'm going to show you, and cut away the negative space. And once the original patent wore out, everybody switched to pantograph cutting. So what I'm going to show you today is pantograph cutting the negative space around. These are the companies, I think this handout's in your packet. These are the companies that made wood type starting in 1827 all the way through. Uh, Hamilton and American wood type were both making type up until 1984. 
still making, it was show card type, but they were still making type. The rest were gone. They didn't last. Or Hamilton, who was known as the Walmart of the wood type companies, actually drove 12 companies out of business by flooding the market with their type. So if you had a beautiful type, they would, they would go into your area and make all this type. They were making four or five million pieces a year. And they would underprice you and drive you out of business. And they would come and go, oh, we're so sorry. You went out bankrupt. We would like to buy. We'll give you some money. We want your patterns and your rights. And they would take them back to Hamilton. And they would copy your patterns and then burn your patterns. And they would put it in their specimen book with a number. And they did that to 13 different companies and drove them out of business so that they could have the designs. So at the end, all you had left was Hamilton and American wood type. Um, there are uh, pantographs are used. The left one is a Hamilton pantograph. You stand up behind it. And the right one is my pantograph um, that has a handle that raises and lowers it. This is how they actually work. Um, and I've learned all this. No one had made a pantograph for a long time. So I learned how the math and how this works. And you have a, I, there's no terminology for this, so I made it up. Um, a, a Hamilton pantograph has a pivot point on the outside of the parallelogram, the, cent, the cutters in the middle, and you trace the pattern on the far left. What I want you to see, though, is see how the R pattern and the center R are the same direction. That's an A pantograph. And those are what a lot of engraving machines are that you can convert. Uh, and here you see it on the table. And you stood up to run it. And you would trace here. And over here, it's cutting it. You couldn't feel it very well. Here's mine. Mine's a B-type pantograph where the pivot point is actually mounted on the parallelogram. And you'll notice that the, the characters are reversed. But again, the parallelogram allows you to enlarge and re to reduce. You cannot enlarge. Reduce your pattern. So if you make one pattern, you can make, um, you can make all the different variations. But again, the same thing, a perfectly straight line. So when I built my first pantograph, I was using a six inch square at a three to one ratio, which should have given me perfect two inch squares, the one I built myself. But I couldn't get it to work. It was always 20,000 off. It was a rectangle instead of a perfect square. So I went back to Hamilton for their waste goose, and I explained my problem to Norb, the old guy. And he says, oh, he says, you're doing it. He says, he says, undo this screw and smack it with your hand, and it'll adjust it. And when you go back, it'll be. I was trying to make the short side wider, and I had made it the long side shorter. So now, I, so I adjusted it, and it worked. But again, he has done it for his life. He's, a, he's, a, he's, he's passed now, but he taught everyone. He was the last surviving type cutter. So here's mine. Again, the same thing. It has a pivot point, a cutting point, and a tracing point. Um, here's the pattern. This is how you do it. You actually make three different strokes. The first one, and I'll show you this when I actually start cutting. The first one goes around the block and cuts the outside of the character away with a big cutter. It traces the character twice. The first one cuts the shape, and the second one gets rid of any vibrations or dust. Then you raise up the counter, and you do the center of the P. That's called a counter. And you go clockwise on that because of the way the cutter is sharpened. And then the last thing you do is you clear all the negative space. And, I, and people call that mow the grass. And when you first start, you mow the grass by watching. And by the time you've done 100 letters, you mow the grass by watching the cutter do it, and you can feel it. One third of the people in the world can reverse their understanding, and they can just look at the pattern, and their brain reverses it, and they can cut beautifully. Another third will work at it, and there's a third that cannot do it. Uh, it just drives them crazy. I had a football player at Kent State walk out on me. He was trying to do it, and he was a gross motor person, and he just, he said, I can't do this, and he walked out of the class. But most of the people are left brain do real well with it. Here are some examples of some fonts off of eBay. Um, I get some ideas from that. Um, this is a Weber and Wells. This is the only wood type font that the outline is a different name than the letter. I made, I made, someone had the outlines and I made them a whole set of solids. Um, this is a beautiful type. I've made replacement letters for this for people. Um, I had to learn a lot about how to do, how do you do that in line? So you call Hamilton, they say, we don't know, we don't do that. They don't know. No one knows this technology. It, it, everyone's gone. Um, so much knowledge lost. But I learned how to do it and figured it out. Um, again, a Latin. This is Futura, 
which I always thought was a modern metal type font, and it was made in 1880. And it's, and it's beautiful. They also make it in metal. But, uh, and then these are just different fonts. Um, this is a, a, a German font. Um, one of the uh, black letter fonts, I don't know what it is. Um, this is an Italian one from Tipo Teca's collection. Lots of little balls and neat things. This is a drop shadow. Um, I think Dave Pete actually had some of this up there, but someone bought it. Um, I've been making some drop shadow. I've learned a lot, but again, I scan the historic books, put them into Illustrator, fix the pantograph math, then figure how do I make a pattern for this, and then I, I make it. So I don't do very many fonts. Uh, Virgin Wood Type does fonts. They have all their patterns are from American. Uh, they bought what was left of American Wood Type. This is again a Hamilton. Hamilton, this is uh, celluloid type. In the 18, 1930s, they were trying to come up with a substitute for maple, and they used the celluloid like they used for film to make wood type. Um, it's glued on, and it's water-based high glue, and it comes off a lot. Um, some people love this stuff. Some people hate this stuff. It's very rare. Um, here you see a whole tray of type from ornaments and things from Germany on eBay. Isn't that amazing? Look at all the different things. Can't print with it in America, but it's beautiful, beautiful type. Um, here's another Italian drop shadow with a line. Um, I use three fluted mill cutters made out of carbide. Uh, I buy them at a McMaster car. They're real cheap, like 12 bucks. The first ones I used to use were $50, and then the students started snapping them, and I would get upset. So I buy lots and lots of $12 ones, but that's how small. That's a 1 32nd of an inch three flute cutter, and they make them smaller. Um, here's my pantograph. Here you see tracing. So again, one side of the machine, you trace around the pattern. Um, here's the cutter cutting. Uh, I built my own sanding machine that was very, very accurate. And after I make the slabs, and this is over my head instead of walking through it. That's good. I buy Amish maple from up in Charm, up at Kime Lumber, big long beams, and I, which is very sad, but I cross cut them into little pieces, glue them together like this, and this is as big as my machinery will handle. And I have a machine from, who sold me from a museum because they wanted someone to make new type. And this fits, and then it, it kind of looks like a, a record player, 700 pound record player, but it cuts the end grain perfectly flat for reference faces and gets rid of the glue joints. Then I can go sand this, starting at 120, and then 180, and then 220, and then 320, and then 400, and then 600 until this looks like a mirror. Then I take it back out to my block leveler and I cut away anything that's not 918. It, so it doesn't matter if one side's higher than the other. And when you're done, you get a beautiful piece of type. I also, for the engravers, um, use three inch beams. And I try to make the type in the middle. Anything bigger than five inches was done on face grain, on face grain, uh, because it's cheaper and you can't find that big a piece. And I did not bring a sample with me. Um, here you see me checking, this is a, called a height, uh, Vandercook plate gauge, and here I am checking to see how close it is, and this little space right here is two thousandths of an inch off. So I would take it, this is Hamilton, they have 14 skids of maple left from 1960, and they're down to 11. They're starting to make type again, they're down to 11. Um, but this is how I learned, I said, well how did you do this? How long do you dry it? Where do you, where do you get it? And they said there's a little paragraph with two sentences in one book. And from that, I applied what I learned. So I had a friend, it says the maple is cut frozen in the forest when the sugar is down, the sap is down, and the wood is stacked and then cut into half rounds. Okay, so I had a friend from knowing woodworking who cut me some maple trees and frozen in the winter and I cut them in half and then surfaced them down. Um, and I ruined the first 200 because I dried them for two hours too long on one day. You got micro cracks, so my friend burned them for me and I made 200 more. And um, here you see a stamping machine. I made this and actually gave it to Virgin, but like the center of the A, these were always stamped by women um, trimmers. I start making A's and I'm not holding the center part of the A straight, I would get crooked. So I thought, this is crazy. So I, they had a machine in Hamilton that used to do this. So I kind of stole the idea and made an adjustable stamping machine that lets me make exactly the right shape. But I had to hand grind the, the shapes. So I learned how to stamp. 
Um, here you see my Hamilton pantograph, which is very big. Um, and again, I make my own patterns. I have a vinyl sign cutting machine um, at my school. And I brought one. And, oh, it's over here. Um, I would make, I would scan the art, make it. Then I use my vinyl sign cutting machine to reflect it. And I would make patterns. And I would use hand woodworking tools and make my patterns, like, like they did historically with tracing paper. And then a couple years later, I got information that I could rent time on a laser. So I made all my patterns are now made on the laser, only because it's more accurate. But again, I deal in thousands. People say, well, you don't have to be close. And I'm going, no, these are printers. And they are very, very picky that you do it properly. So I learned to do that. Here you see me cutting one of the frozen half rounds on a bandsaw. Um, and I always thought they used big maple trees. They didn't want anything over 18 inches. Um, again, it makes chips, not dust. This is a trim saw, a special saw uh, that they have different places that measures in thousands. And you can cross cut and cut your blocks. So after you make your type, for example, if you're making a font, Virgin makes 12 E's. And then they go and they, they cut one at each end of the block. And then they go to their trim saw and they cut all the E's at the same time. So if you're working for Hamilton and making a font, your job today is to make 300 J's. So you would make 300, and then another person would trim them to exactly within a few thousandths of the space you needed for letter spacing. So I've been learning, and I try to share. I share with Hamilton. I've made them some displays. I work with some museums in Europe. Um, here you see a little part that doesn't cut. And I said, what do you call that? And they, no one knows. It does, no one knows. So I said, that's kind of a friend of mine, uh, Nick Sherman from New York, said, it's kind of like a metalworking burr. So we call that a burr. And it's become the standard in the world now. That I made it for a term, and they use it. Um, but again, and you, it's so hard, you can't break it off. You have to use tools to cut it off. You would think, oh, I'll just snap that. End grain hard maple is tough. Uh, here you see cutting the letter out. Here you see the pattern, tracing the pattern. And there's the finish. But notice there's no, there's no um, descender in the N, and there's no point in the A. So that's a Tuscan A. Um, it used to be the most common, and now mine are the most common. But um, here you see the tracer. The tracer has to run against the wood. And I make my own tracers. And when you come up to watch the demonstration, you will see I have them in every thou 20 thousandths from 70 thousandths up to um, 3 eighths of an inch. And I just have learned as I go. And what you're trying to do is learn what combination of tracer and pattern, and I'll show you that when you come up. There's math. Um, what, what diameter cutter do I use at three to one ratio or two and a half ratio? So I have learned, and it took two years for me to finally understand what Norb was saying. He was saying, when you make that W and you reduce it three to one, if this part of the stroke is, a, is three eighths of an inch, your finished product should be an eighth of an inch, because it's three to one. And so I was, I was making it, and I'm going, that doesn't look right. What is wrong with this? And finally, one night, about midnight, I was making a, a, a replacement letter, and I thought, wait a minute. If I just change this up 20 thousandths bigger and don't change the math, it added six and a half thousandths to the stroke. And it worked. And I was like, oh, that's what heft means. When Norb was saying, check the pattern, check this. And he was doing it with a caliper. I was doing it with a, a digital caliper. So now I understand, and I write it down when I learn what ratios work. So like this pattern, I used to have it in paper. And my daughter said, Dad, why don't you write it on the pattern? So after five years, I write it on the pattern. And when I go to colleges, I have it. Um, this is a pattern for David Wolski, and it did not work. Some of the things I make did not work. I could not figure how to make this little a banner work for him. And I gave up. I, I tried, I spent an incredible amount of time and I could not figure how to make that drop. But again, vinyl sign making, you use the, the negative space as a pattern. Um, here's my daughter on her Vandercook 4 proofing off in the basement. Um, and here's me printing off some of my type on a show card press. And she didn't have a gripper on it, so I said, well, that's crazy. Grippers aren't hard to make, so I make Oh, we got rid of it. I make replacement grippers now that go on to 
show card presses, and they let you, and they fit all the different ones, and Vandercook ones, and zeros, and so if you're interested, I'll be putting that on my blog. Here you see the wood drying at Hamilton, and this is what they would do. They would spray it with bullseye shellac, with a, like a painter's spray gun, and Norb said sanding and polishing and spraying three of these racks was a day's work for a, it's again, a union, wood type making is union. It's also it paid a small rate, and then you got so much per piece. It's like, and so uh, I said, what about safety glasses? He goes, no, they didn't do that. What about hearing protection? Because the, their, their things are running at 35,000 RPM, and, you, and it just destroys their hearing, and no one can hear. He says, no. He says, you didn't, you didn't wear that kind of stuff. I went, okay. Uh, but that's what it was. But again, I, uh, one of the things I did was I took... Um, and found that as I started tracing the patterns that the, the sugar in the maple in the pattern actually is sticky. And so I actually started putting baby powder on it and uh, then it would slide. I don't know what they did because I didn't see it on their patterns, but um, it really solves a problem. And one day I said, I want to be like Hamilton. So I made a fancy star with the pantograph and I made 250 in one day because it was a giveaway thing I was doing. And I worked 12 hours. And I was so bored out of my mind doing the same job over and over and over and over. So how they did it for a living, I don't know. Um, again, the Hamilton Museum is in a new location. Here you see a sample of what I would do for trimming. Then after you make the type, someone has to go in. The women usually go in with stamps, and they stamp the points of the W, and they use engraving tools, and they make it clean and perfect. Uh, with stamps. And, those were, and the women trimmers were upstairs on the second floor, natural light all the time, and they would, um, they were better with fine motor skills, better at repeated hand tasks, more dedicated to time on job, not out drinking in the bars every night like the men were, and they only had to pay them 60% of what they were paying the men in the union. So that's, how, that's why the trimmers were almost always women. And they actually have records that show that. They didn't pay them as much as they used. But for us, in 1880, in a small town in Wisconsin, what a great job to have, I guess. And some people, women were involved with shipping. Some women were involved with sales. Here you see me uh, hand polishing with boiled linseed oil and pumice. Um, I did learn a lesson. Boiled linseed oil will spontaneously combust on rags. It's in industrial arts, they always said, well, don't you know that? Put that in that oily rag can because it's going to catch on fire. The paint thinner doesn't do it. The lacquer thinner doesn't do it. Tongue oil and boiled linseed oil. Spontane well, there's a chemical reaction, and in a small space with oxygen, they'll go up to 460 degrees and catch on fire. So the first time I made type, I put the trash can out by the curb, and my wife woke me up at midnight and said, do you smell something? And I looked out the window, and the whole trash can's burning because it had caught on fire. Hamilton had a small fire, too, but they had cement floors. Um, so again, lots of handwork involved. This is part of my sander. Um, and this is what my slabs look like. And I put them on my kitchen counter and it drives my wife crazy. But when I'm done, I, after I spray them and polish them, I stack them and bring them into the house. Um, and again, that's, it takes me a whole day to do 20 slabs. It used to take me a day and a half. And I'm, I've gotten really good at it. Here's my homemade sanding machine. Um, and I think we've seen everything else. Last thing, this is a new uh, a company called Nesbitt, and I thought this was interesting, so I stuck it in. Nesbitt Type Company was 1844 or 46. They were in New York City, and their type was sold through the Bruce, George Bruce and Company metal type. And he invented and made some really neat fonts, and he got to name them. So if it was bent, he called it grotesque. Here's one that's called amalgamated, where if it's top black at the top or bottom, and, and some poor woman sat there and engraved all those lines. Uh, but again, he was inventing this. This font comes on every Macintosh for free. Um, it's been stolen and unpatented and all that. But, but again, you can't patent a font anyways. Um, but again, this is available now digitally. And then drop shadow. Um, here you see another amalgamation. Here's a Roman extended. And look at this little diamond down here, fancy shaded. Um, some of his names stuck. Some of his names didn't get used anymore. Here you see a diamond. Here you see a streamer. A streamer is type you put together, and it makes a big, long line, reversed. And if you look at this, you will see that this is an end. 
and then these four fence posts make the E, and then these, uh, the, the I is two units. So again, you, this was a, a streamer, and no one else ever made it. Um, but it's really pretty. Here you see hand engraved um, roses and fashions. Here's acorns were really big. For about 20 years, acorns were a big thing in type, and there were lots of acorn things made. Down here are drunk Irishmen type. Um, again, they didn't want Irish in America taking our jobs, so anytime you needed a bad person during this time period, they were Irishmen, and drunk Irishmen too. Can't work, can't do jobs. Look at this beautiful hand engraved roses. These were all engraved by women trimmers. Um, this is something I don't make. This is the first thing I ever made. This was a border by Page, and I stole the design. Well, it's too, a long time ago, but I took this element and made it, and uh, that's how I got started. Uh, the specimen books, which are so collectible now, were trash. So a lot of times, if you go into an older print shop, you can find those. I also work out of reference books. Um, Hamilton, for example, sells this actual number 14 specimen book at Hamilton. There's the factory. But if you look in here, this is actually um, at full size their type. Um, I work out of a reproduction I do from uh, 17. This is my copy of a different one, number, and it has Roughly the same thing, but again, all the type has numbers, not names. If you look at the original big designers, a page, and I did not bring a page specimen book, Tubbs and Morgan and Wilcox designed almost all of the wood type in the United States. Those three, and they got to name them. A lot of the font names we use now, they got to name it and invent it. Um, my daughter bought me for Christmas this book, um, which is Rob Roy Kelly's book, printed in 1966. Um, she said, do you really want this? And the nice thing is in the back, it has 100 fonts, perfect specimen fonts. And I said, sure. So she got it on eBay for $188. And three months later, they reproduced it for $25. <laughs> so if you're going to buy this book, go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon, and for $25, you can buy this book, which is exactly the same book with all the articles and information in it. Um, and the, my... Dave Pete upstairs is selling this one. This is one he paid to have reproduced. Heber Wells, which we always thought was two people, but it was, that's his first name, was Heber. And um, he invented some really neat stuff, especially borders. And then the last book is, this is a coffee table book. It's called The Art of Wood Type. And the history in the front half, third, is very, very accurate history and correct. And the back half is 125 fonts, a picture of the collection, and a proof. So for me trying to make replacement letters for you, I get beautiful, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I taught this, so that was really dumb of me to beat on his microphone. Um, so again, specimen books, I do reproductions sometimes from people's proofs. Um, the lasers allow me to do some different things. So we're gonna cut here in just a minute. Um, I did bring a pattern. This is a pattern. It's they were always two-sided, half-inch plywood in the middle and quarter-inch on each side. Handmade. This is a pattern from Morgan and Wilcox. Dave Pete got, had this in his garage. And we traced the font down and figured out what it was. So that's 1870, so that's old. Um, these are my patterns. And today we're going to make an ampersand. Uh, Jen Farrell upstairs from Starshape designed six snowflakes for me like William Page did. No trimming. Beautiful, beautiful historic snowflakes she designed and they were made for the type cutter because there's no hand work. So that's as loud as it gets. And when I have students, I let them wear hearing protection. So I have a pattern, in this case an ampersand, um, ampersands are really big right now. This is a Columbia, Columbus font ampersand. Um, and I'm making it 10 line high. So I have made an assortment of 10 line high maple blocks. And I'll pass these, these are the other ones. You can feel the finished surface of that is polished maple, very, very smooth, okay? So I put this block in. I did a bunch of math and figured out 
what the ratio had to be. I changed the lengths of the parallelogram arms until when I touch this here and touch this here, it exactly fits here on the block. So this is actually two, ratio 2.3 gives me for this block. But I could also, as I said before, I can also, I'm going to drop them, aren't I? You can also, from the same pattern, by changing the ratio, I can make those sizes and anything in between. So if I make two for you, I'm going to make 10, and I'm going to sell the other eight. So what you have is a tracer, and I figured out that this 160 thousandths tracer will exactly fit into the pattern over here. Oh, I got to raise this up just a minute. So see how that just fits in that little gap, and you cut left to right. So I've, I know from experience that this is what I need. So I'm going to go left to right around the entire pattern twice. The first time does most of the work, the second time um, clears the chips and the dust. Okay, so the cutter is down, on. Where do you start? It doesn't matter. Just pick a spot. And again, this is an old machine, so it doesn't like. The more it runs, the better, the warmer the bearings get. So you go right around. So there's the first pass. I don't know if you can see that or not. On the block, it's kind of in the dark, there. And the second pass clears out the chips and gives you a beautiful final design. And people say, how do you break a cutter? You break a cutter by using a real small one and going so fast that the chips can't clear and it just snaps it off. All right, so that's the second cut. I know where to be for the best for the camera. So there's the second pass. And because I have it set up, I can take it out and show you. So there's the second pass. And there's your basic design. Left to right, all the way around. Five minutes, we're good. So, when you put it back in, you have to put it in reversed. And that's what the college students do sometimes, is they do it wrong and, they, and then it ruins it. So now I'm gonna do the counter. So I'm going to raise up the tracer and drop it in the counter, lower the cutter, and I'm gonna go clockwise twice around, and then I'm gonna mow the grass and clear the space in between. So there's that. And the last thing to do is to get rid of all the negative space. So you can, if you're good, you can picture it in your head and follow it here. Or when you've done 10,000 pieces, you can, in your brain, know where you need to be and clear this off. Now, if this was much smaller, if I was doing a little tiny one, I would be cutting with smaller cutters much, much slower. And that one's done. And people say, well, how, the only thing I have to do yet is stamp these sharp points where the radius doesn't give me a clean corner. So that's what I've learned in eight years, is how to make this work, how to make the material, how to do research, talk to older printers, find out how things work. So the books are up here if you would like to look. Um, I brought some other patterns. Um, this is an example of face grain. Anything bigger than five inches, they did on the face grain, like a, like a flat board on a kitchen table. And I actually I know a person who bought, who used to do billboards down in Covington, Kentucky, and he has mahogany patterns this big for fonts after font, pallet after pallet after pallet that he's been storing. What does they stamp? Um, I'll show you. Do you, you grind, you, you grind, and that's two o'clock if any of you need to leave. You, um, you grind them out of old files and 
Um, oh, I need that to show you. You grind them out of old files, and I watched me cut myself in here. Here's some. Yes, they're little chisels. This is the center of one. And you actually sit down at a table and you put this on there and you smack it with a hammer and fix it. The more common thing yeah, is... That's why the stamping. The stamping was part, of the, was part of the trimming process. The more common thing is called flicking. Flicking. So on a star, no matter how fine of a cutter I use, when I go around this star, I'm going to have a radius right there. So what they, women do, and this is an actual... This is an actual tool reproduced from Hamilton, is they held this like this, and they would use it like this, and they never got carpal tunnel. They told me. There was a woman who, who still did this for Hamilton, still alive, and she did a table this big twice as wide in 20 mi 25 minutes, and they had figured three hours. But what you do is you touch the point, and you roll it up, and you touch the point, and you flick it. I use exacto knives. I think they're easier. Uh, I have a friend, a friend I taught this at who uses scalpels. But what you end up with is a whole bunch of stamps ground for special jobs. Like this is a little teardrop for the middle of a six-line Tuscan A. But I wondered why Hamilton only had 10 stamps. And what I've learned is there are about 10 basic stamps that do almost every font. Like the curve of the, in the N in this font is the same as the, the W. So for this, Hamilton would use a quarter inch cutter and clear all the big away. And they would use a smaller cutter to do most of it. And they would use a very small cutter and then they would, the ladies would stamp those five points. It's, uh, Virgin calls this a, a three cutter. So you would do all hundred W's with the big cutter. And then you would switch and go down and down and down. And learning that math. And um, any other questions? Uh, an example, of the last thing, the example of what I learned was I was making an R with, with Norb, and no one's allowed to use Hamilton's pantographs with them. Uh, now they let you, but and he, he did an R, and the first thing he did was go around and go touch, 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 and he touched three spots on the outside of the block. And then he came back and cut it. I said, why did you do that? He said, in this font, those are the three places that chip. So I pre-back cut those. And so he, those cutters knew that, a uh, five-year apprenticeship for cutters and a three-year apprenticeship for trimmers. Okay? Again, my business cards are back there. Um, I have stuff up in my booth. If you want to come up, I can show you some more stuff. These books are listed. I can get you that information. Um, thank you to the library for setting everything up. This is a Bookman font. If you ever get a chance to buy metal type, buy Bookman, buy the auxiliary. It's a whole bunch of metal pointers and ands and nuhs and ofs and twos and fancy. S's with curly Q's, and it's called, and this is, uh, this is used all over the world. This is what most people pick to make. This program was recorded on August 25th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.